Good morning. As we <coughs> discussed yesterday, the forthcoming festival of Hanukkah celebrates the victory of the Maccabeans <coughs> over the idolatrous and corrupt Hellenists. <coughs> which was, uh, was one of the four empires mentioned in a few of the old prophets and especially described in the, vision, the visions of Daniel. <coughs> and uh, the basis of this is that the Jewish people of the people of Hashem, whose purpose is to spread the service of Hashem to the whole world. <coughs> Over the time of Avram Avinu, our forefather, we've had constant opportunities to fulfill our purpose, to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and thereby influence the whole world. But unfortunately, it was being delayed again and again because we were not at sufficiently high level. <coughs> so the first power that destroyed the temple and banished the people from our land, in part was already done by Sanchedev, Sennacherib, King of Syria, who banished the ten tribes, but the temple still stood. There was a chance for the redemption to come, but we're not on that level. And Wuhanetzar, when his empire spread, the Babylonian Empire, it was his ambition to destroy the Jews. But, it's interesting, although it destroyed what was left of the Jewish people and also the holy places in the land of Israel, but he recognized that the Jews were very brilliant people. And therefore he brought to his palace some of the young, clever Jews. He saw they were very good. <clears throat> One of them was Daniel. In addition to that also, he brought over Jewish scholars. He said, okay, you can't be in your land, but you can be here in Babylon. Although persecuted the kings, <coughs> would not allow any independence for the Jewish people, but gradually his empire, in fact, allowed the Jews in his empire a lot of autonomy. So that was the first empire. The second empire was the Persians and the Medes who took over, who, <coughs> who destroyed the Babylonian Empire, took over from them. Unfortunately, we know <coughs> in that empire, which was a different approach to life as that of the Babylonians. But there was a stream of anti-Semitism Just like Nebuchadnezzar, being like a world conqueror, he saw in the Jews a certain threat to his approach, which dealt with conquest. The Persians, they were <coughs> hedonists, they believed in enjoying life to the full. And there was a streak there that recognized also the Jews, although they were clever, but they were a threat to their lifestyle. So we have, in the Persian Empire, where Jews unfortunately were also assimilating, 
more easily than in other circles because if they assimilated they could easily become wealthy and enjoy material benefits. As the sages point out, they enjoyed the huge banquet which went on for half a year. So, anti-Semitism rose to destroy all the Jews. And we're seeing the Jews all over the empire and they're still different to the others. So we've got to destroy them. And that's what we celebrate on Purim. How Haman, the spirit of Amalek, that already wanted to destroy the Jewish people at birth, continued with him. His Haman Ha'agagi, his leftover from Agag. Amalek is really, if one wants to understand it more deeply, the extreme hatred that becomes even suicidal. And they say it's better if we destroy the Jews and keep, get them away from this planet. Which is what Amalek wants to do, because Amalek knew quite well if he's going to attack the Jewish people. After the God of the Jewish people had brought terror to all the people in Canaan, which he recite every day in the Shira, the Song of Moses, and when he saw that their God destroyed the Egyptian Empire, which was enormous, he said, no, I'm, I'm going to throw myself in the boiling bath where I will be scorched and killed, but he'll cool it off for any other anti-Semites. At least I've done, I've done my mission, fulfilled my mission. In fact, Amalek stated, it says in the Chumash, why did he hate the Jewish people so much to destroy them? Even if it meant to killing himself more or less, because he knew the Jews were going to win. Because the Jews develop the human conscience, and we have to destroy the conscience. That's the voice of Amalek, which reappeared with the same concepts through Homan, and reappeared again with the successor of Homan of the last century, Hitler, said the same thing, to destroy the Jews. So that was the Persian Empire. Then came the Greek Empire. It's well known, the wars that took place, Alexander the Great was able to conquer the Persian Empire and even widen his empire much more than the Persian Empire. <laughs> he recognized, as we already described, that the Jews were very great. And therefore he didn't allow any religious persecution of the Jewish people. I think Alexander the Great can also explain to us why in the visions, vision of Daniel concerning the four empires, he appears as a leopard. Why is a leopard? So this we can answer from Pepe Ovis, Ethics of the Fathers. In the Ethics of the Fathers, it says, Heve az kanome, and in fact this is, this is quoted at the beginning of the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. When you get up in the morning, it says you'd have in your mind to be Oz, be strong, like the leopard who jumps out on his prey, big jumper. And what's the idea behind this? What's the azot? And this is what we're going to analyze now, the azot of the Hellenists. I think the easiest way to understand it is by looking at another statement in, in the Ethics of the Fathers, which says that Aspanim Lekehino, someone who's got uh, strength, power of stubbornness, strength, obstinacy, like the goat is obstinate, it's an obstinate animal. That's why it's called Ace, it's got this power of not giving in, you know, hitting with its horns. So, it says someone 
who's got azot has to go to Gehenna, reflect also in our morning prayers when we say, we start off by saying, if Oz Kanamer, and later in our prayers we say, Ratzomel Fanecha, say to Hashem, Shatzileli Ayom, you should save us today and every day. May Aze Panem or May Azut Panem from human beings whose face is filled with arrogance. Because Azut means arrogance. And Azut Panem means we don't want any spirit of arrogance in our environment. So we see Azot is evil. And nevertheless we say Az Kaname is good. So we see the two types of Azot. But you can even tell me where we find this reflected in the Yom Kippur service. Can you tell me? Where does it reflect in the Yom Kippur service? What I'm saying now. To understand it's going to be the basis of this next section here, which we're studying in the Maral. Because this, this, the symbol of the Greek <coughs> Empire is Azot, Kanamer, like a leopard. So, how do you understand this? And there are many more contradictions I tell you about. Because the Gomorrah says there are three signs of character whereby we can recognize a real Jew, which is the seed of our forefathers. Do you know what the three characteristics are mentioned in the Gemara? They're Rahmanim, they have compassion. They are Gomli Chazadim, they like to love and kindness. And they're Baishanim. Baishanim means they're shame faced, which is actually the opposite. It doesn't say Az Panim le Gehenna, Uboshet Panim le Gan Eden. Certain pick up what? Someone who's shame faced, he goes to Gan Eden. It's the exact opposite. So, what is it? Is, is Azot, which is called arrogance. <laughs> or, you know, if it's, if it's arrogance, it generally has negative connotations. But it's also called, called extreme perseverance and stubbornness to reach your aim. So what is it, good or bad? What's the basic answer to all these contradictions? I bring you another 10 or 20 contradictions, both from the Tanakh as well as from the words of the sages, that Azot is a very good thing. On the other hand, we say the tzitz, the crown which the Kohen Gadol wears on his brow, <coughs> is to atone for Azot Panim, Arrogance. Is it good or is it evil? And we can see the concept of being obstinate, obstinate, and persevering to reach your aim. Where do you find the solution to this? Is it good or is it evil? So I want you to guess, because I mean, did, did you some shiur about Yom Kippur? This is shown in the most extreme fashion in the Yom Kippur service. Where? By what? So what's the climax of the Yom Kippur service? We go through it in the, in the Musaf prayer. What do we go through? What do we reenact in the Musaf prayer? That you all know, Musaf prayer of Yom Kippur. We bow down to the floor. When? But for what did we reenact? In our synagogues, we reenact <coughs> the service which took place in the temple, <coughs> and before that in the sanctuary. And what was the climax of the Yom service? What was it? They put up a thread at the entrance to the temple, and the thread was red, scarlet red. And then, at which point did it go white? As the prophet says, if your sins are scarlet, as red as scarlet, they'll become white as snow. 
And that was shown on the Yom Kippur, in the temple. By means of what? So what was the service? The two goats. Two goats. What are the goats called? They're called Seir Izim. Called Seir Izim. Which means the hairy, the hairy goat. So Seir is because of the hair, which is a concept as well. It's externalism, like by Esau. It's also a symbol. But let's deal with the other symbol. Why is it, what's the name of the goat in Hebrew? What's it called? Asasa. It's called an Ez. Izim, Ez. Ez is the same root as strong, obstinate strength. But that's, that's, Ez. that's Ez. So it's like this. I'll, I'll, I'll first I'll tell you from uh, someone who, who knew nothing about Judaism, but he was a Jew, and many of his ideas have also sources and parallels in Jewish thought. So he used to say, he sees no difference in a Jew and a non-Jew, except the Jews are more so. They're more. That's one way of putting it. Now it came something else. There's also a Hebrew word which is according to the American dictionary. And Americans use it as well. A part of the English language. It's called chutzpah. What's chutzpah mean? You know, any, have you ever heard the word chutzpah? No, unmitigated, What's it mean? Unmitigated goal. Huh? Unmitigated goal. Arrogance. It means What's arrogance. arrogance. It means arrogance. Chutzpah. Well, it's a Jewish word. And of course, sometimes people use chutzpah, <clears throat> generally speaking, in a bad sense, but some is also in a good sense. It says, before the Mashiach comes, chutzpah yaske. Chutzpah will make you great. <clears throat> so I could say like this. <laughs> I think this way, this answers the whole question of keep a service. Human beings have been given strength. There are many human beings who, who they don't use it much. Their, their character doesn't lead them to be so active. So they take it easy. Everything is they're laid-back individuals. And the truth is that there are many, many nations, many groups that are basically laid-back. The Jewish people is known universally, and history has proven it to be true, that on the whole they're more ambitious. They like to reach the top. Some like to reach the top of saintliness. They work hard. And they persistent. And they go over and over again to train themselves to become saints. This is the highest level. And therefore, even the words which are put in the Chumash, when Hashem, He gives a bad name to the Jewish people, and says, in Moshe Rabbeinu, repeat, Am of Atta, you are stiff-necked people. So, the sages therefore come up with a statement, as we'll soon see in this text also, that amongst nations, the Jewish people are azim. Amongst animals, it's dogs. But amongst human beings, it's the people of Israel. We are azim. We are a nation that's been given by Hashem the more so characteristic. If you're a scientist, you won't be mediocre, no. You want to get, reach the top and you get the Nobel Prize. If you're in economics, the same. Jews have been chosen as experts in economy by so many different monarchies and states. They know the, the tops. They put themselves in, throw themselves, and they get through. That's part of our characteristic. 
And when, let's say, even, unfortunately, the other way around, this is mentioned also already in the Chumash, Ham Kshe'orev sometimes means the obstinacy goes into your egoism. And therefore you want to be the top, which makes him argumentative. And sometimes, not only argumentative, you want to be top over other people, you want to be top over Hashem as well. And you argue with him, or you leave him, and you go and invent atheists, because the Jews invented atheists. And the Jews were amongst some of the strongest instigators of atheistic communism. And the founder of dialectical materialism was a Jew who became baptized, Karl Marx. So this is the Jewish people, the biggest heretics and the biggest saints. It's referred to also in some interpretations deep into of, the, of the different promises. You will either be like the stars of heaven to bring light in the darkness, or you are being like the dust of the earth, the lowest people. Because it depends where you're going to put yourself. You, the Jews on the whole are can't be as me mediocre like the majority of human beings. Therefore, on Yom Kippur, we're going to make a decision. Are you going to be a, an, an A's that's going to be offered up in the most holy place in the world, the holy of holies of the temple, on the most holy day, by the most holy man, <laughs> if that's what you're aiming for, or are you going to be one that wants to, thinks they have freedom if you go and run away from it all, and you go and follow vain idols, either make yourself into a god, or, or worship the different spirits and demons of the desert, the desert means that you're going to say the world has no meaning, the world is a desert, as some Jewish philosophers who've left the Torah declare, the world is meaningless, and the whole world doesn't mean anything. This world is, is, is just a constant series of happenings instead of a home. They're going the wrong way. And that we have to decide in Yom Kippur. Each individual will decide which way you're going to <laughs> you use your quality. That answers all the questions. So where do we find ambition among the nations of the world like a leopard? Because the leopards can sit somewhere <coughs> springs out filled with energy to get hold of its prey. He can, he, he, he can, he can, he can jump faster than m many other animals of prey. Who'd like to jump Alexander the Great? I mean, he, he died as a young man, and in his few years, he jumped and probably did more than any human being from the point of view of conquest, of not only of land, but also of ideas, because he was, he was also a thinker at the same time, probably than any great leader of the past, and died very young. And we see it also from what the, what the Gemara tells about him. So, yeah. He jumps very up, very up, very fast and very high. Unfortunately, when he died, in fact, that's referred to the wings, because the leopard in the vision of Daniel has wings. These are the way in which Hellenism spread throughout the world. And there actually, there were four different branches of his kingdom, the Hellenist uh, area that was covered. That's what happened afterwards and foreseen by Daniel. So this this is why why the Hellenistic Empire is known as a leopard. And unfortunately he recognized the value of the Jewish people, and their religion, and their teachings, their wisdom, but successors were too much involved in, in idolatry and also permissiveness. So they took uh, the enjoyable physical aspects of Greek culture and they left aside most of them the moral aspects.
there was a bit of morality left in the, in the branch of Ptolemy, as you already mentioned. Right, you have any questions on this? So now I'd like to show you this in the, in the text which you are in front of you. So the, if, in the first column, we, say, we bring here the verse, Malkab Sareb in Torah. If a person will say to Yesh Chokhmah for him, Ta'amin. Now why is he bringing this here? Because Chokhmah Bagoyim reached its highest level in human history through the Greeks, through actually a small, a small area, you know, mainly in the area of Athens, where there's highest, highest, but also some around, the highest level of, of human wisdom and civilization. And then it says in Uvadia, I'll destroy the wise men from Edom and Tavuna, understanding from the mountain of Asa, because Edom was the fourth kingdom. They took over from the Greeks. But the Romans, they, on the whole, also for later civilization, they transformed the higher philosophical, even somewhat moral concepts on the basis of wisdom, which was reached by the highest minds of the Greek Empire. And then for them, that was of secondary significance. And it became destroyed. Because they, um, they did have Chachamim, but they weren't honored as much as the great military heroes and the great builders of an external materialistic civilization. And that's what's going on today also. That uh, Western civilization contains within its elements the Greek and the Roman element. And uh, you know, the Greek element was widespread, at times, but it, but it became you know, the, the Nazis, even the communists, destroyed that aspect of it and replaced it with the Roman element, which was, it takes on different forms in each generation. But when the Pasuk says, Malkavas Erebavim in Torah, the kings and princes amongst the nations <coughs> do not have Torah. Or the Kara Malchut, they therefore, the empire, the civilization of the Greeks, Yavanim, they were not really opposed to existence of Jews. They did not accept this decree, you've got to kill every Jew, oh no. You've got to try and get the Jews to become Hellenists, to follow the enjoyable aspect of life, to become hedonists or even the intellectual aspects of life which do not really include God. Even when, when they came to the recognition from the point of a chokhmah, wisdom, you can't explain the world without God. That's why many of the philosophers believed in one God. But they also believed in lower, God, lower powers. And they did not really believe in Torah. The Torah means a moral code given by God. And that's why Daniel saw the third empire, which was similar to an Amer leopard, because this animal is Asbiotel. Because as it says, pick up what here, Askan Amer. You should be strong like the leopard. Now, these are called Midot, he was at Mida. This is really a fundamental principle. The word Mida means a moral quality. What else does it mean? Measurement. Pardon? Measurement. Measurement. Yes. What else? In the Chumash, it says, Velavash HaKohen Midovat. The Kohen garment should be of linen. So the word in Hebrew, original Hebrew of the Chumash, and used frequently, is for garments, because garments are made to measure. 
So we, we're all given different qualities of character. You can use them for good, or you use them for bad. Azut is that inner strength, the potential given to every person to develop. You can use his inner strength for good, and use it for bad. It can be Eiz Hashem, and Eiz Lazazel, it's called Azazel. If that strength goes in the wrong direction, it's used as a tool to oppress other people and to deny the power of your soul and conscience. Then, using that strength for evil, instead you can use it for good. So this is, this explains to us the word, oh, that's why sometimes, for example, she'oz kanameh, it also says in Pekavot, lo ay bashan lamet, the person wants to learn, it's no good if he's shamefaced. A person to learn has got to be ambitious. And he's got to try and push through his ambition with inner strength. The people, everyone has got this quality. The question, what use it for? You can use it for being against Hashem and against other people and desire to destroy. You can use it for the best things. That's why Hazal say the word Oz. I in Zion, in the Tanakh, it means strength. So we say it also quite often, Hashem oz de amo yiten, Hashem yivarech et amo vashalom. Hashem gives strength to the people of Israel, therefore Hashem blesses the people of Israel with peace. Because you only get peace with strength. So now I'll tell you the following, in fact I think I heard it myself. First president, Prime Minister of Israel, Ben Gurion. Ben Gurion, generally speaking, he had a Tanakh in his pocket. Yeah? And he learned Tanakh, and he had a shir in Tanakh in his, in his place in Jerusalem almost every week when, when he could, somebody giving a shir in Tanakh. And he quoted it frequently to the nations of the world. Not quite so much to the Jews, but the nations of the world, yes. And that was part of his success. He came out with the Tanakh in the most difficult debates concerning how we can build up a state here. I think that's the fault today, they don't use the Tanakh enough, the diplomats. Some of them don't even know it. And some of the Gentiles know it better than the, than the Jewish representatives, which is part of the problem. So he, well, he, he tried to get advanced weapons and he was accused. He said, why do you need, you, you only want peace, you don't need advanced weapons. He was often approached in that way, why do, you, why do you have to build up such a So he said, quoted a pasuk, it's true, we only want peace, nothing else. But to have peace we need strength. We need to strengthen weapons. If we don't have the weapons, then, uh, to use a common saying, I don't know if he used that, but in English could have used this, we want peace, but we don't want to be put into pieces. Because yeah? then there's nothing, nothing left of us. Then we have to defend ourselves with weapons. We have to have them available in case of need. We're already assigned certain limitations of the use of arms, not conventional arms, weapons, but in the world in which we are, there's so many who want to destroy us, we have to be prepared. In fact, that will create often the balance of terror, which is true that this is what's helped a great deal. In fact, when uh, you know we've got, there's a, a, a square in Jerusalem called the Davidka Square. Why is it called Davidka? Then if you know, one, there's a, it's called a short cannon. You'll find on that junction there's a short cannon. Yeah? So that cannon can shoot a, a, a bomb, but it doesn't go very far. It makes a huge noise. So this was in the War of Independence. That short cannons. That one, you shall I, 
that also in, in Tzafat there's also Davidka. They used to call it short can Davidka. Why are you in Hashem? Hashem David Amelach. Yeah? So, what happened? Uh, there was a rumor around in you know, many of the police, even the police stations of the British, when they left, the, when they stopped their mandate, they said the decision we made who's to get which parts of this land. The partition plan, when it went through, was accepted by the Jews, not accepted by the Arabs. They were not ready to accept it. So what happened? The British at that time, unfortunately, they were a bit more loyal to the Arabs than to the Jews. They, you know, they didn't allow immigration, white paper, you know, the history. In any case, they, there was rumors around at that time, the, the Arabs around, they didn't as yet have non-conventional weapons. But there was rumors. Everybody knew the Jews were involved in inventing the atom bomb. And from, you know, Einstein and the others regretted it very much afterwards. And Einstein, famous for his saying, had he known what would be done with his, uh, his uh, discoveries, he would be preferred to become an installator or a, or a you know, plumber rather than, a, rather than an advanced scientist. But still, the fact is, I've seen the letter he wrote. He was under the impression that the Nazis already had an atom bomb. Yeah, that was the impression. Therefore, he said, that's why he said, I'm willing to help that we should, the Allies should produce it first. Why? Because the Nazis. If, it would have had, if they would have, they, they were working on it hard, at great pace, but um, the Allies, through primarily the scientists, most of them were Jews, and non Jews as well, worked hard to produce it sooner, because otherwise the Japanese and the, and the, the Japanese Nazis and the European Nazis was afraid they would, they would kill everybody, because they didn't care about killing people. So, you know, that, that was his, but he, made, but, he, but he thought he made a mistake. He shouldn't have done it either. Because it, it opens a new, a new destructive power. Anyway, I'm going back to Ben Gurion. So therefore he said, to prove his point that Israel has to have weapons, he said it says so in the Bible. It says God gave strength to the people of Israel. And then God can bless the people of Israel with peace. But they've got to have strength first. So therefore it's our duty to see that we Jews in the Jewish home, promised by the League of Nations, the Balfour Declaration, and promised by the Peel Commission, our part, we have to have strength. We have to have the best weapons. We don't want to use them at all. Yeah. For I never to use them. But we we we'll even sign a, the proliferation treaty, I mean, the, not to be spread further. So, so Jeff, of course, the situation is it's a very, very risky approach, but he, he said, I've got a verse to prove it. So the sages say, they say something different. They bring proofs, Ein oz ela Torah. Because the Laman says in the Pasuk, another Pasuk, it's the Pasuk in Vrede, now, the, the many Pesukim tell him, but there's one specific, particular Pasuk which says, You, Hashem, have founded strength, even from children who learn your Torah, in order to destroy your enemies. And therefore they say, Ein ozel la Torah, the real strength is the Torah. That's the real strength. And the strength of the Torah is a peaceful strength. Why the strength of weapons, the stronger your weapons are, and your enemies don't give that up their hostility, they're trying to get even stronger weapons. And that's what has happened. Today we know it. It's very, very serious. And that's why Netanyahu is right. When he says the, the real important situation is Iran. Because their threat 
that's why they're, they're, now, they're now saying that the army here has to prepare now, that the whole of Israel will become front line. Because Hezbollah, from the north, they've, they've, they're being heavily armed by Iran, and all their missiles can easily reach Dimona. Yeah? Dimona is the, is the place where we've got our non-conventional weapons. We need to reach every place. It's a very, ser very serious situation. And uh, see what's going on otherwise in Israel. It's security is at a low ebb. It's very difficult. So let's hope. So what? what but we we rely on it. In Oz el Torah, the Torah. That's why at this point the real defense. There's no real defense known if Chas v'Shalom non-conventional weapons go to the hand of those who believe in suicide bombing. So it's a very, it's very risky. If you, and you can't, you know, you can't rely on miracles. And even the Torah said, of course we have to prepare ourselves as we lead in this week's Pasha. Yaakov Avino, afraid of what's happening. That's all it got to do with what's happening today. You've got to prepare for three things. You've got to prepare to feel that we should be saved, appeasement, but if necessary, more of defense. There's no other way. But defend ourselves some. It's the best way. But one. But you, how can you defend yourself if more or less whole groups of Islam they are training from youth upwards that the highest thing you do is yourself become your, your whole body should become a bomb. That's it. Your bodies have to become bombs. And their, their brains work in that way, their imaginations work in that way. The highest thing to do is to become a bomb instead of a living human being. Become a living bomb. And uh, look, we're, we're now Hanaf is, uh, is, uh, has been made a target, you know, very, very troublesome. But what can help us? Oh, the tail. Anyway, this is Azot. The Azot of destruction, which we're facing today. But we have Azot in the right way. We've, we've got to use inner strength for the sake of peace, with peaceful methods. Learning Torah also, not always easy. But let's put our strength in learning Torah. This, this, this is what is also the trigger in Jewish history for divine protection. So here it just continues. It says, Lo Abayshin Lamed. For learning, you've got to use Azot. No point being a, a laid back person, an armchair, you've got to learn. That's why it's so important, it says, as I said yesterday, you, or in, <laughs> to have questions and answers. That's why I give you texts. You have any questions? I keep on asking you, have you got any questions? And if you don't have enough questions, it's a sign. Probably you're not you're not putting your mind to it, and that's why in a Gemara here, that's what that's what you need. You need a Gemara here because it, 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 to read the lines of Gemara, it's just like reading double Dutch, unless you put your mind into it. Mm -hmm. But the same applies even to this year as well. So therefore, that's why I give you a text. So in fact. It says, just a, it says Masechet Beitza. Why was the Torah given to the people of Israel? Why does Hashem go ask the Torah, not to the other nation? Because we've got chutzpah, because we are people who are stiff-necked and we're obstinate, we don't give up. That's the essence of the Jewish people, not to give up. More fancy people have been gone through the Holocaust and they don't give up, on the contrary. They work harder. There are many people I know, both in business people as well as teachers of Torah, who went through the Holocaust. And they came out of the Holocaust and they, do the, they work so hard with persistence to go and uh, uh, help Chesed institutions. 
to practically help other people in every way possible. <coughs> and if they could, they try and even get become rich some of them business, but not for themselves, to to do it for themselves. The horrible survivors who live uh, below the poverty level, but they they earn money, plenty of it. Some of the millions, they give it all away to charity. They feel that's what they have to do. Or yes, um, yes, was it yesterday? No, it's going to be Giving Tuesday. You know, the concept of Chesed, which has now become very strong, especially in America. You know, many of the millionaires they make societies to give, and it's competition who gives the most. So they, 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 okay, we got an email also. There's going to be a Giving Tuesday. So for some reason, some of them made it yesterday already, but it's really for the end of the year. 31st of December, Giving Tuesday, where there's going to be competition, who can give most to charity? And this, this, the, I mean, the, the, it's, it's a spread to all of them, but the spearheads on the whole are Jews who work in that direction. Because the Jews, they like to give. And they want to give. The power of Chesed is very strong in the, in the, in the Jewish community, especially these people who Especially also people through the Holocaust, because they think, uh, why did I survive? To help others. I knew a person who was uh, built up quite a business and did lots of charity. He says he loves to invite people to his house because it's in his mind. He can't get out of his mind and out of his feelings the trauma of starvation, which he went through for a few years in the camps, starving, and almost, um, being a threshold of death. And therefore, if he can have people in his house and give them food, it gives him such uh, pleasure that he can't imagine. Because he feels, now I can give him. Mm -hmm. And the other people, they give, that's, that's one. So it's the giving, the giving Tuesday I mean, in America. That's Azot. But why did then Tanbi Why is the Torah a fire, it says? At his right hand is Eshtak. These people should be given a Dat Esh. They've got to be given a religion of fire. Otherwise, they were given guidelines how to use human energy. To use human energy, it should not be just warm, it's got to be hot. Hot to the extent that you reach the maximum of your ability, me me know of the right hand, to do kindness, to give of yourself to others. But it says more than that. If it would not have been given to the people of Israel, the other nations can't stand in front of them because they might go and use their stiff neckness, the obstinacy, that if any enemies rise against the Jews, they'll annihilate them. And therefore they need the Torah to control the energies. The Torah is that which channels the energies in the right direction. But if you don't have a power from above that channels the energies of Jewish people, you don't know what they might do. They'll go and destroy the world if anybody opposes them. So they have to be limited that we channel the instincts of asserting yourself to the maximum has got to be directed to Beit HaMikdash, to Kedusha, and not to the meaningless and destructive droughts of the desert. So let's hope we're all strengthening Torah and that will bring peace to the whole world. <coughs>